<clears throat> Father, uh, we've uh, we've benefited tremendously in ways even beyond our understanding, just from having your word, from having your son uh, visit us in the flesh and teach us from all the ways you've revealed yourself to so many and all the work you've done through what you've said and done. Uh, and today, as we open your word again uh, to talk about uh, things that your son has taught and done, we ask your help that we'd be blessed again in, in yet greater ways through what we consider today. And since what I'm preaching today is very, very closely tied to the gospel itself uh, and the very purpose for Jesus coming, I ask all the more for your help through your Holy Spirit uh, for me to actually convey all these things very clearly, but also for those listening uh, so that they all will understand and believe and act in whatever ways you're going to put upon them. You know, I ask that eternal life would spring up you know, from the, the preaching of your word. So we ask that today, and we ask it in Christ's name, who died and rose again to make all of this happen. So we ask it in his name. Amen. <clears throat> and uh, given the orientation of the room, maybe I'll turn a little bit just to <laughs> handle this here. So the camera will get a pr more of a profile, I guess, this time. Uh, but yeah, let's go ahead and get started then. <clears throat> so technically, we're still in the gospel, according to Matthew. Uh, and we've made it again to Matthew's final section, which is the seventh section of his gospel, as I've broken this up uh, into its various sections. Uh, so this covers the final three chapters of Matthew's gospel. So 26, 27, and 28 is the, the section 7 of Matthew as I've outlined it. And in this section we see that Jesus, with sovereign humility, uh, is murdered on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins and is resurrected in victory to inherit God's kingdom. <clears throat> so this is uh, the conclusion to the gospel of Matthew, which happens to be the gospel. Uh, period, what we're reading about in these final chapters. And so Matthew is very dedicated to that and has gotten us to this point and has set up everything to get us to this point. And as I've said before, you know, his sections usually have distinct portions within them. And the first portion of all this uh, is showing very much that Christ is sovereign over his death, that he is following a plan that requires him to die. And he is very much going through with that, and he's in control of all of it. And as part of that, Matthew records this last supper and first communion meal between Jesus and his disciples, which is where we've been for uh, quite some time. Uh, we've been studying this for you know, several sermons that I have done. Um, I keep increasing the number of sermons I have planned for this. And you know, currently, I think it's a maximum of eight uh, which is, I think, higher than what I told you last. So, yeah, it'll eventually stop, I promise. But we're, we're trying to get as much as there is that we can get out of this, and there's a lot. But today is sermon number five in all of this. And today I'm going to focus completely on verses 27 and 28 uh, in this. And in these verses, we see Jesus give the clearest explanation in the entire Gospel of Matthew, at least, for why Jesus plans to die and what his death will accomplish. I keep saying, this is the plan, this is the plan, Jesus is following the plan. What is the plan? Well, let's read. Uh, let's back up actually and read from verse 26 through verse 29. And it's really the middle part that I want us to uh, really see here. So while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. 
So forgiveness of sins was the entire reason for the death of Christ, according to Christ himself. So what is the plan? That is the plan. And that is why Jesus is orchestrating everything ultimately to end in his death. Uh, that's why all this is happening. Now with that in mind, my sermon today is uh, named somewhat facetiously, but I think it gets the point across as to what we're doing today. The sermon title is Sin, 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 and the Forgiveness of Sin. And that very much contains my outline as well, if you can imagine what each of those uh, pieces of the title uh, signifies. What I really want to do today is make you feel the value of having your sins forgiven. You know, if you already have experienced this blessing through the gospel of Christ, then to help you feel again the great value of what you've experienced. And if you have not yet had your sins forgiven, to make you want that, uh, seeing how great of a value it is to, to have your sins forgiven. To make you feel that value, however, I must talk about sin a lot. Uh, you cannot possibly comprehend the significance of having your sins forgiven until you comprehend the significance of your sin. We've really got to make sure you understand that. So with that in mind, my outline today has four headings. So first, I need to talk about what sin is based on who God is, because it's impossible to define sin without actually looking to God himself. You know, he is the one who actually defines what sin is based on his very nature. And then secondly, I will describe why sin is so terrible. And when I say terrible, I'm really kind of, uh, for the most part, zoning in on uh, the emotional response you ought to have to your own sins. Like you should say, this is terrible, you know, that I am this way, that I have done these things. And then thirdly, I will talk about God's wrath against sin, which is more of the, uh, I guess you could say, an objective viewpoint, you know, what sin really is, the fact that God in his justice, you know, declares this is worthy of punishment. And so talking about the wrath of God against sin. And then finally, after all of that, we'll be ready to actually talk about the real point of today's sermon, which is describing the forgiveness of sins offered in the gospel. Uh, so finally, we will make it to that point and see the value of having your sins forgiven. So today's sermon uh, is for everyone in front of me right now, uh, everyone I'm looking at right now as I look out at all of you. Uh, some of you, perhaps, who are very young, uh, have grown up hearing these kinds of things about Jesus. Uh, to a large degree, the wording I'm using, at least, is familiar. Uh, but maybe you have only heard them as things we believe and we teach, uh, but have not actually made them your own. You haven't actually uh, dealt with these things in such a way to actually experience the forgiveness of sins. And if that is the case, then I would say that now is the time uh, to actually make them your own beliefs, your own teachings, and most importantly, your own experience, uh, your own bit of faith toward God, trusting in him for the forgiveness of sins. Now, for others of you uh, who maybe would say, well, been there, done that, uh, there, I, it's, I feel like I have to remind you there's always the possibility of self-deception. Uh, this is something the Bible very much does talk about. Uh, people who convince themselves that they are at peace with God when they are not. A person might think himself perfectly safe when he is, in fact, moments away from disaster. You know, that is how so many things happen when people actually do uh, meet their death. I mean, they're just, there's no awareness that they might actually die soon. Uh, that is very often how it happens, and it's true in spiritual matters as well. These matters of salvation are exactly the same way. Uh, so, for those of you who are in that position, always take opportunities like these to examine yourself for a real understanding of Christ and a true faith in Christ. And that goes double for those of you who would be reluctant to say, you know, that I have trusted in Christ so as to receive that forgiveness of sins. So again, all of these things are for everyone today. Uh, so with that in mind, let's make our way through these things. As I said, to understand forgiveness of sins, we must first understand sin. Uh, and that's really more than just defining the word, but of course it's going to start there. You know, what actually sin is. 
And to understand sin, we've got to understand who God is and what God is. Because without uh, God, without thinking of God himself, there really is no way to talk about sin. I mean, you can talk about crimes. Uh, you can talk about foolishness. You can talk about mistakes. You can talk about all those things, but sin. Like, there is no sin without God and without what God has said to us. So we've got to really talk about God a little bit first before we can understand sin. Now, we could say much about God, and we have often said much about God, but I'm going to focus on God as a king in particular, because I think this is the most helpful way to eventually talk about sin. Uh, just to read something that Jesus said, this is going to be one of those sermons where I jump around a lot, so it's up to you if you want to follow to all of these. But Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 15, uh, gives us kind of a summary of what Jesus was teaching while he was traveling around uh, during his earthly ministry. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 15 says this, Now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So the kingdom of God is at hand. That's kind of the operative phrase. And of course, Jesus talks about the kingdom of God quite a lot, uh, which has some implications that might escape you if you've not thought about it too carefully. Uh, if we're talking about a kingdom of God, that implies that God is a king. And how you feel about God being a king is probably going to depend on how you feel about kings, how you feel about somebody who has absolute power over you and everything around you, which is fundamentally what a king is. I suspect perhaps that the younger you are, the more likely you are to enjoy the idea of having a king, uh, because kings are often thought of as powerful and glorious and courageous and so forth. You know, a lot of kids are, you know, born and raised on stories about great kings and things like that. The older you get, the more cynical you get. You might say, ah, kings, ah. But as you're younger, maybe you're a little more open to the idea of having a king. Uh, nonetheless, however you feel about it, however you feel about him, God is a king. And whatever you think about the king, and whatever you feel about having a king and about God as king, you cannot forget the one perhaps most important part of living under a king, the thing that is most operative, and that is the king must be obeyed. Like if there's anything that sums up your duty to a king, it's the word obey. Uh, the dominion of a king requires an absolute obedience from the people to his will. There's no higher power that can overrule a king, and there's no vote of the people that can stand against the king. You know, such as we have in our own country and in our own time. You know, there is no, there's no taking a vote under a king, you know, as properly understood. Now, the younger people among us, again, probably have the best idea of what that might be like. And I say that because the younger you are, the more people you have to obey in your life. You know, you have parents, you have teachers perhaps, you have other grown-ups you know that have some kind of authority over you. Uh, maybe even to some degree your older brothers and sisters have that kind of role of telling you what to do on occasion. Uh, and, and that could be, you know, coaches for sports. You know, that could be any kind of situation. But if the younger you are, the more likely you are to understand what it means to have to obey a lot. You at least have the idea drilled into you from a very young age, and it's pretty much most of your life. But all of that obedience, and as uh, heavy as it is, and I admit that it is, the obedience is good because it's one of the ways we have been taught to think about God. You know, all these people we have in our life that tell us what to do, in some respect, reflect that one aspect of God and who he is. That God is a king and he must be obeyed. As Jesus said when he was going around preaching, his kingdom has arrived. And since his kingdom has arrived, we must obey him. You know, that's the operative phrase there. You know, the kingdom of God has come, therefore repent and believe in the gospel. You know, that's the implications of God being a king and his kingdom coming in the person of Christ. Well, now that we understand who God is and what he is, we can now understand sin. We can actually think about this word sin in a way that actually gives it some meaning and some, some bite, if you will, as well. 
Sin is what we call it any time we do not obey God. You know, so fundamentally, you want an easy definition of sin, there it is. Any time we do not obey God, we have sinned. That's what sin is. And since we're speaking now of God as a king, uh, let's call that sin something more fitting. Let's maybe give it another word that you might not necessarily put there alongside the word sin. Let's call it rebellion, you know, to actually stage a rebellion against a king, to rebel against him. Now, people, if they choose to, whether it's wise or not, they can choose to rebel against a king if they desire to do that. And they can rebel against God as well, since God is a king. You can choose to sin, which is basically choosing to rebel against the king. And when that happens, that is sin. So rebellion against God is sin. And all of that is clear so far as it goes. I'm sure that none of that is in any way hazy to you or any way open to an argument. But if we're really going to answer what sin is, we need to see what God has commanded us to do. You know, we say, okay, we got to obey God. So what is God requiring of us? What are the commands? Well, again, Jesus gives a very good summary of what God has commanded. We've seen this already in Matthew's gospel. But just to jump back to Matthew 22, we can read verses 35 through 40. And Jesus, in his normal fashion, gives us something very quick and easy to read and understand about obeying God. So Matthew 22, starting in verse 35, uh, one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question, testing him. Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So Christ says that everything commanded by God depends on two things, love for God and love for other people. Uh, so that's a very quick and easy summary of what God commands us as a king. These two commands are not only the two greatest, but they are, in a sense, the only two because they summarize all the others. Anything else that God has commanded can be placed under the heading of loving God or loving other people. So to live in any way which is not loving is to sin against God. You know, the command that God has given us is to love him and love others. Anything other than that is rebellion against the king. Therefore, altogether, we understand that God is a king, that sin is rebellion against God, and that such rebellion is a refusal to love him or other people. So you want to know what sin is you know, defined in relation to God? There you have it. You know, sin is disobeying God in a way that is just refusing to love other people and rebelling against the king in that fashion. So far, uh, so good in terms of understanding what we're talking about today. We're not really finished talking about sin, however, because we've got to come at this from another approach. Uh, and right now, I want us to think about how terrible sin is. And I really want to focus on just the word terrible there and what I mean by that. By that I mean you should feel things when you think about your own sins that you have committed. You should feel deeply afraid. You should feel extremely sad. You should feel angry at yourself. Uh, maybe even a little sick to your stomach whenever you sin. You know, all of those, and especially all of them together, uh, might be called terrible. Like, it's like, oh, I feel terrible. It's like, well, did you sin? Yes, well, there you go. Like, that's how it ought to be. You actually ought to feel that way and experience sin that way when you think about it. And I want to talk about that in detail, and I want to talk about that in five ways. So just five ways that maybe will help you see, if you've never thought about this before, just how terrible sin is. So let's work through these. First, when we sin, we are sinning against the rightful king. So not just a king, but the rightful king of everything. And again, I will appeal to what younger people know, because I feel like you experience these things so piercingly that you might understand very well what I'm talking about here. Think back to a time, if you will, and you know, grown-ups can do this too if you want to, but to focus in on the younger people. 
Think back to a time when you made something. Could be anything. Could be a picture you drew, something you built out of Legos, something that took more work than that. Like it could be anything that you made. All right, now think back to a time when one of your brothers or sisters or some other child destroyed that thing you made or maybe tried to steal it from you. You know, they could come in there just like tearing through and knocking over your, your Lego construction or maybe they saw a picture you drew that you really liked and they took that and tried to hide it and uh, you knew they took it, you eventually found out. Think about that time. In that moment, you were angry, all right? You did not like that, I'm willing to bet. And you felt, I think, if you had thought about it for a moment, you felt that you had the right to be angry. It's like, he's like, hey, I built this. I made this. How dare you take it from me? How dare you destroy it? You know, that is very much what you were thinking and feeling. You made what was destroyed or stolen, and no one else had the right to, to destroy it or steal it. Like, it was in every sense yours. You made that. Well, in the same way, God owns everything and everyone because he made all of it. This is very much a biblical concept, and it very much accords with what we think and feel as we consider things that we make. Let me just read you a couple of verses from Psalm 24, which uh, summarize this very well. This is Psalm 24, verses 1 through 2. The earth is the Lord's, and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the rivers. So when God claims kingship over everything, he is the rightful king. I mean, is he the creator or not? If he made all this, it's his. He owns it. If he made you, he owns you. you know, it's all totally in his possession on the fact that he is the creator. So how is it that you dare to sin against him in the world he made? Like anything you do with yourself, anything you do with some other person, anything you do with some other object, you're doing that with stuff that he owns, that he created. And if you're sinning, you're taking his stuff and doing stuff with it that he did not intend. It's effectively the same thing as some other child stealing your picture or destroying your Lego blocks and things like that. There's really no difference except in greatness and that what God has made is greater and therefore the sin is greater than anything that anyone would do wrong to you. So rebelling against the rightful king, that's what sin is. He owns all this stuff. He is right to set these rules and to make rules about things that are his own. And when you sin, you are rebelling against a rightful king. Now following that thought, God is a kind king. And we might say a good king, but I want to especially focus in on him being kind, his kindness. And therefore, you should feel terrible when you sin against him and his kindness to you. Right? This should also be another aspect of sin that, when you think about it, should make you feel terrible. When people do, in, in this world, when they do rebel against a king, they usually feel like they have the right to do so because the king has treated them badly. It's like that normally whenever a rebellion of some sort does spring up, in the history of the world, and you ask them why they are rebelling, they can usually make a list. In our own country, uh, you know, right or wrong, when we uh, declared independence from Britain and we wrote that Declaration of Independence, I don't know if you've ever read that, there's a part in there where we cite the things that King George III did that we did not like, that we thought were tyranny. That's very often how rebellion goes. You know, we very often rebel against kings when we feel like we have the right to because he has not treated us well, he has not done right by us. But none of that at all applies to God. In God's case, he has used his authority over the world to show kindness to the whole world. This is a good king. This is a kind king. For a moment, take some thought on everything you have or everything you enjoy. Just whatever you possess that you like or whatever things you do that you enjoy doing. Just take a moment. And now that you have assembled some things like that, uh, add to that list your very life, without which you could not enjoy anything. If you were, were never born and never survived this long, you could not have enjoyed anything 
any of those things or had any of those good things. And now realize that God is the one who gave you all of that. You know, not just your life, but all these other things. I mean, he's in sovereign control over the whole world. Anything you have, anything you do that is good, that you enjoy, that's from him. As the way James puts this, you know, using some rather picturesque language that James is known to use, he says this, James 1, verse 17, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. You know, he pictures it very much as being like the sun, you know, shedding its beams of bright light onto the earth. Well, that's God giving you all the good things that you have and enjoy. And if God uses his authority as king to show kindness, you ought to be ashamed, really, of any time you take his gifts only to sin against him. I mean, how good, how right is that? I mean, here's God giving you so many good things and you just sin. You know, you rebel against a king without any reason to rebel. You know, your declaration of independence would be blank. It's like there's no complaints to list. It doesn't make any sense. Now, pressing the matter further, this is number three of the, the five ways in which sin is terrible. God is a wise king. And so you should feel guilty when you sin against him. His wisdom is evident and just brings out the foolishness that is in you every time you sin. And again, I will appeal to our rule experts, the younger people among us who endure so much from having to obey so many rules and commands as they do all the time. I want you, especially the younger kids, uh, to think about a time when you disobeyed your parents and then you decided yourself that that was a really bad idea to disobey your parents. So maybe you weren't even caught or punished. Maybe you were, but even before then, you came to the decision on your own, I should not have done that, bad idea. Just think about a time maybe like that. Now I ask that because very often when we disobey, we discover why we were told not to do something. Uh, it, com it becomes very evident once we've completed the deed, it's like, oh, that was not a good idea. Sometimes we hurt ourselves, sometimes we hurt other people by accident, uh, we destroy something we didn't mean to destroy, or we create greater problems than we intended. And it could be any of those things, could be all of those things, but very often, whenever we do something we were told not to do, the consequences come swiftly and we realize, oh, that's, uh, that's why that rule was given to me. I maybe should not have broken that particular rule. And from this we learn that rules exist for a reason. They don't just come out of nowhere. I mean, they are given to us usually to protect us. And that's the mentality behind everything your parents have commanded you to do or not do. A lot of it comes down to that. And God is the same way. In God's case, he commands us to do things or forbids us from doing things for our good. This is a king who is wisely giving us commandments that actually help us if we would obey them. And just to read another passage of scripture here that you know, touches on this, this is going to be Proverbs 13, verse 12. We see this, 1321 rather, excuse me. So Proverbs 13, 21 says that trouble pursues sinners, but the righteous will be rewarded with prosperity. Which is a pretty sweeping statement to make, but generally does hold true. Trouble pursues sinners. You sin, get ready for trouble. I mean, because very often the consequences of your own sins, you know, even if we imagine God standing back and doing nothing, what you did is going to come back on you because God's rules very often protect us from trouble that might find us otherwise. God is wise in that sense to give us such commandments. But then you say, no, you know, I will do what I want to do even if God has wisely told me to do otherwise. That is very often the, even if you don't consciously think that, somewhere back here in the back of your brain, that's what's driving you forward. It's like God says this, but I'll, I'll do what I want. You know, regardless of how foolish it is. And how can you not feel terrible when you sin that way? I mean, that is just ridiculous to do. I mean, it's not, it's not even remotely intelligent, but we do that. 
And that is part of what sin is, going against the wise commandments of God. And we can press that part of things a little bit further too in talking about how terrible sin is. Sin makes a human more like an animal. And I don't know if you've ever thought of it that way, but it is very much true that every time you sin, you're acting less like a human and more like some animal. Now, in what I've said so far, you, know, you certainly have reasons not to sin, right? Even if we just stop the sermon right now and I asked you, hey, are there reasons not to sin? You could give me some answers based on things I've just related to you. And I know very well that in the moment of sin, uh, some part of your mind is telling you, no, don't do that, here's why. You know, <laughs> at the moment when you're getting ready to do something you know you should not do, there is some part of your brain saying, hey, uh, stop, not good, this is not going to end well. There is some part of you saying that, and yet you do it anyway. You just kind of proceed onward recklessly. And when someone confronts you about that sin and asks, why did you do that? You usually don't have an answer, do you? You just kind of stand there like, mm. like, there's nothing to say. And if you do say anything, it's probably the answer that has never helped anyone. I don't know. Like The most common answer after someone's been busted for a sin. Why did you do that? I don't know. Why do they say that? Because there's nothing else to say. There's no reason. If you want to lay out a logical reason for why you sin, there is no logical reason. There's no wisdom behind it whatsoever. The fact is you sinned because you desired to sin. There was nothing, there was no thinking about it. It was all what you felt, all what you craved. It was just a desire. There was no other reason. There's nothing more to say about it than that. And that is why I, sit, I say sin makes us, makes humans more like animals. You think about this from an animal perspective. Animals don't have minds like ours uh, that allow them to, you know, think about things the way we think about them. They don't have a concept of reason. They, they aren't able to think about the future and consequences and things like that. Animals typically just do what they desire. Dog sees a squirrel, chases the squirrel. You know, cat sees a mouse, chases the mouse. I mean, there's, there's not even a thought to it. It just activates that part of them. They do what they desire. At best, animals will do what we train them to do when we give them treats and punishments and things like that. Yeah, you can train an animal, but in the end, there's no clear mind within them to guide them. We have to be their mind very often. And that's how this whole, you know, owner-pet relationship works, or if not pets, then like, you know, your cattle or whatever, if you're a farmer, any kind of thing like that. Many of you do have pets, though, which is why I come back to them, and you know how it is. Maybe your dog or your cat does something destructive or harmful, right? You know, they've torn up the couch cushions again or whatever. You know, maybe you look at the animal in your frustration and you say, why did you do that? And the dog's just, mm. and he's not able to say, I don't know, but you can tell he's like, oh, he maybe even whimpering there when you confront him on that. That's exactly how it is. And that should sound familiar because that's how you respond when you're called out on your sins. There's another bit of the Psalms here that I think is worthwhile to read on this. Psalm 4920 makes this interesting statement. So man in his glory, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. All right. Man in his glory, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. You know, don't use your brain, and die like a dog. That's basically what it comes down to. Whenever we sin, we ignore the understanding God has given us to make us better and different than the animals. I mean, we're the ones made in God's image. We're the ones given dominion over all the animals. But every time you sin, it's a step down. It's a step down to what they're like. So when you sin, you're saying you'd rather be like a dog or a cat or a cow or a dung beetle or whatever, you know, any kind of animal you can think of there. You're saying you'd rather be like them than be like a human that can actually think and make wise, good choices, which is, of course, ridiculous unless you actually want to eat off the floor and use a litter box and things like that. In all of this, you know, we have every reason to feel ashamed, uh, just letting our, letting our desires get the better of us in the way that an animal would. But every time we sin, that's exactly what happens. 
it very much demotes us to the, to the level of an animal. But most of all, when we talk about how terrible sin is, we must talk about sin as a decision to not love anybody, which is probably the most terrible part of all of this, which is why I've saved it toward the end of this list of ways that sin is terrible. Earlier, I quoted Jesus, who summarized all commandments from God under two commandments about love. Let's read that again. Matthew 22, verses 35 through 40. Again, we see this. One of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question, testing him. Teacher, what is the great commandment of the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Now, the great thing about love, it's that it's, it means you're getting your happiness through somebody else's happiness. Maybe you've never thought of it that way, but when you say that you love somebody and you act on that love, you're acting in a way that's going to eventually make them happy, you know, maybe not immediately, but eventually will. And you're also saying that you are, you are at your happiest when this person is happy as well. That's the great thing about love because it leads to effectively everyone being happy and there's more happiness. It's like this great uh, sharing and growth that happens whenever people love each other in that way. Now in contrast, the terrible thing about sin is that you're only seeking your own happiness. Never mind the happiness of another person. I want this, I want to do this. And it doesn't matter at this point what anyone else thinks of it or how anyone else is affected by it. So never mind the happiness of another person. So anything you steal, you know, any time you lie, any harm that you do, in any such sin, you are actually saying that nobody else deserves to be happy but you. Like you're going to look out for your own happiness. You're going to get what you want. You know, the other person doesn't matter. Like what other people are going through, that doesn't matter at all. It's all about me. You know, as though you are the only one who matters in the world. When you sin, that is effectively what you're saying. Nobody else matters. No one else matters but me. And that's really odd. Because when you stand back and think about it, even you would not admit that that's true. Even you wouldn't actually say that. Again, kind of to target the younger people who are a bit more familiar with these kinds of things, uh, how many of you younger people have run, you know, crying and screaming to mommy and daddy because one of your brothers or sisters did something bad to you or some other kid did something bad to you that you didn't like? You get real tore up about that, right? And how many of you did something wrong toward them the very next day, right? Think about that contrast. You know, someone hurt you, you're all offended by it, you're all upset about it. But then you did practically the same thing to them at, on a later day. I mean, what's going on there? Does any of that make sense? In getting upset about wrong being done to you, you admit that person should have acted lovingly toward you, but then you don't act lovingly toward them. It doesn't make any sense. So you know that it's important to show love to others. You know that you should do to others as you would have them do to you, as Jesus said. You don't act that way, but you know it's true. You feel that it's true. And let's not forget God in all of this. You know, the, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So let's not forget him. The greatest of all commandments is to love God. And God, like humans, likes to rejoice in what he makes and does. You know, God loves to make something and say, Ah, I have made this. Isn't this wonderful? This is great. You know, this person... You know, this person is doing exactly what I would have them do. You know, isn't that wonderful? Like, God loves to do that. God rejoices in the righteous. But with every sin, you actually give God reason to be angry or disappointed at you, rather than happy in what you have done. Isn't that what God says before the flood? You know, like, I will destroy man which I have made on the earth, you know, for I regret that I have made him. I'm sorry that I made them. 
You're like, why? Because mankind was so wicked. I mean, that is how God responds to that. You know, it goes both ways. He can rejoice in what he has made. He can be remorseful about what he has made. And loving for God is ultimately about giving him a reason to rejoice that he made you. But with every sin, you give God reason to be angry or disappointed at you rather than happy in what you have done. And that is all sin is. It's your decision not to love anybody, you know, not to love God, not to love another person. And it ought to make us feel terrible when we think of it that way, that we're just refusing to love others whenever we sin. Now, by now, I am sure we all want to hear about that forgiveness of sin uh, that I said I would talk about, because that really is the theme of today's message. But we're not yet ready to talk about forgiveness. You know, there is more. You know, I said that there was going to be a lot about sin, and we have yet more to talk about. One more thing in particular about sin to discuss, and that is God's wrath against sin. The fact that God gets, gets actively angry, if you want to call it that way, about sin. Now, wrath is our word for very great anger. If you ever want to know what the word wrath means, it's like there's being angry and there's being wrathful. And the wrath of God is his great anger against sin. So, and again, this is something that the Bible does talk about. Just to read very briefly, maybe a classic statement of this in Romans 1.18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So the wrath of God is revealed against sin. God himself cares greatly about our sin. You know, this isn't something that he is in any way neutral or passive about. Since God himself loves all that is good, he therefore hates evil. And he hates evil with the same passion that he loves goodness. You know, that's how this works. I don't know if you've if you reflect on your own feelings and passions, you will see that that is the case. Because you love this thing, you hate the opposite of it. Well, God is the same way, and God hates sin. And this is the point, though, where people start to argue and start to try to make excuses for themselves and try to clear themselves of any uh, kind of wrath of God coming against them. Again, maybe to take a, a notice from the experts among us, the children, when it comes to things about obeying or disobeying. I'm sure that whenever you are about to be punished for something, you try to talk your way out of it. You know, that's a very common thing. And really, I don't mean to pick on kids with that because adults do the same thing. But you kids know about that as well. Anytime you're about to be punished for something, you try to talk your way out of it. And yet, when somebody else is going to be punished, you're fine with that. It's like you see this person has done some terrible thing. like, yeah. Yeah, get him. Like, he deserves it. You're totally fine with that. Especially, and again, looking at this from a child's perspective, especially when maybe one of your brothers or sisters did wrong to you. Like, you want them to be punished. It's like, hey, he broke this toy of mine. How dare he punish him? Like, you actually want that. You even tattle on each other to that effect. I mean, you want them to get in trouble. Now, that should tell you something. It tells you that punishing sin is good. It's right. It should happen. When somebody does wrong, there should be punishment. But then you're the one that does wrong. Oh, that's different. How can I talk my way out of this? It's like, ah, that's not right. That is, that is inconsistent, as we big people say. Uh, like, that is, that is not something you should be doing. If it's right for sin to be punished, then it's right for sin to always be punished, even if you're the one doing it. And in God's case, it is right for him to punish sin. It is right for him to find the rebels and punish the rebels, those who rebel against him. Now, that is the very reason, of course, that God made hell. You know, this place of you know, burning fire that we sometimes talk about. Hell is the place designed by God to punish all sin finally and forever. He certainly grants a, a reprieve, a delay, to give people a chance to make right with him. And we'll talk about that later. But, you know, it does eventually happen. You can't just wait forever. You know, to read the, one of the classic descriptions of hell as a lake of fire, you know, from the book of Revelation, Revelation 21.8, we see this. But the cowardly and the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, immoral persons, and sorcerers and idolaters, and all liars, 
Their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And that's how hell is described. So you got to ask yourself, do, do you appear in that list he gave there or any similar list in the, in the Bible here? Now, are you, you know, can you find yourself under the title of coward? Can you find yourself under the, the, the unbelieving, the lack of faith? How about liars? That, that one usually gets everybody, right? Because practically everyone has done so. Anything worse than that? Because there's plenty of other sins, and there's worse sins than those that he mentions there. I mean, if you've ever done anything like that, you know, you're looking at your future, your rightful future, you know, the future that ought to happen. Hell is God's response to all these sins and the sinners who commit those sins. This is how the king puts down the rebellion. Hell is the great threat we all face as sinners under the wrath of a God who rules as king over all. You know, this is the thing that should get our attention. And hopefully it does have your attention. But again, here come the arguments. And people do try to argue their way out of this stuff. We might argue that we've done enough good deeds to outweigh the sins. You know, think of these things as being kind of on a set of balance scales or whatever. But when we examine ourselves more closely, we find that the good we do is rarely, if ever, done out of a love for God or love for other people. Remember, the, the summary of all that God commands is to love. You know, anything that doesn't come out of that, you know, it doesn't actually count as anything. More often we do the good we do because we're told to do it or to get something out of it for ourselves. It is very common for people to have that in their minds as they go about things that they think are good, that they do. The truth is, any little good that we do is just a pause from our normal way of living, which is usually not focused on God and not really that focused on love either. That's usually not the active part of our mind as we think about what we do, what we say, what we don't do, what we don't say. It's usually not there at all. And as such, our good deeds are more like the good deeds done within an army of rebels, if you want to come back to that analogy. If you want to imagine this army of rebels here, you know, actively trying to overthrow the king, you know, what, what good are any of their good deeds? You know, if one rebel helps another rebel, will that goodness be remembered on the day the king has his victory over those rebels? It's like he beats their army, he rounds them up and says, okay, it's time to execute these rebels against me. And one of them says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like one time this guy dropped something and I picked it up and I handed it to him. Isn't that good? What does it matter? You're a rebel. It's time to die. Like that's the whole idea of putting down a rebellion. It doesn't matter these little itsy bitsy good things that you do along the way. If it's done in a state of rebellion against God, it doesn't even matter. All such deeds will be forgotten since they were done in a time of rebellion. And God rules his kingdom the same way. And at this point, we're standing on very dangerous ground, aren't we? I mean, this is a terrible thing. You know, more terrible than just considering sin in itself. The wrath of God against sin. This is intimidating stuff. With every sin, we weigh ourselves down with guilt, which we rightly feel. And with every sin, we make ourselves more of an object of God's wrath as a rebel against his kingdom. So whether we view sin by itself and just how we ought to feel about it and how we ought to think about it, or if we think about the future when the judgment of God is going to be executed, however you look at this, this is bad stuff. I mean, what's to be done? I mean, is it game over yet? I mean, is that, is that, how, we, is that how we end? Well, with that, we can come on to the last thing I want to talk about today because we're finally ready to talk about the forgiveness of sin. Let's go back to this passage that I read at the beginning from Matthew. Matthew 26, verses 27 through 28. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. And this is where we meet the gospel. Now, whenever you hear us say the gospel, uh, we're just saying good news. You know, so if, you're, if anyone ever asks you, what is the gospel? Your answer is good news. And if I say good news about what? 
It's good news about how Jesus you know, has saved us from our sins. Like that, is, that is the good news we're talking about here. The good news is that God himself has provided a way for our sins to be forgiven. You know, he's provided a way, you know, a, a, away from all the terrible stuff we've been talking about. He's provided an alternate path that we can follow. Now, I have said that God uses his kingship for kindness. And even toward terrible rebels like ourselves, like you and me, you know, God has arranged for kindness. You know, he's very much made a way. To forgive a sin, first of all, is to release the sinner from punishment. Is to say that, okay, this, these terrible punishments you deserve, those aren't going to happen. You know, that's the first thing maybe about forgiveness. Secondly, forgiveness creates a chance to start over. You know, in this case, for the sinner to stop being a rebel and to start being a true servant of the king. You know, to change sides in the war, if you want to put it that way. And that is the gospel. You know, that's the good news that Jesus has offered and that Jesus has died to accomplish and risen again to secure for us. According to Jesus, his death is how God has arranged for forgiveness of sin. You know, that's why this is the plan, to go back to what we've been doing in Matthew's gospel. That's why Jesus planned to die and has put so much effort into making sure it happens eventually. Uh, this is the plan. His death is how God is going to arrange for sins to be forgiven. Now, by rights, we are the ones who ought to die, and we are the ones who ought to suffer in hell. After all, if I'm the one that has sinned to my sins, then the punishment should be mine, right? Uh, that's how it would normally work. But God has provided another way through Jesus. Jesus suffered on the cross, and Jesus died for our sin. That's what we mean when we say that Jesus took our place. That's what we mean when we say that Jesus died for our sins. Now, in human justice, if you want to think about this from an analogy, in human justice, we sometimes do this kind of thing in allowing substitutes. So let's say you've you know, broken the law in some way, and your punishment is to pay a certain amount of money you know, to make up for something that you broke or some harm that you did. You know, maybe that's how that works. And you don't have that money. It's too much. It's way too much beyond what you can pay. But maybe you know someone who does, someone that loves you and cares about you and is willing to pay that for you. Well, that solves the problem, doesn't it? You know, that, that ends, the, that ends the, uh, the burden of injustice upon you, right? That justice is fulfilled by doing that. Your friend pays the, the fine for you. He pays the money for you. And that's it. It's over. You're free. You're totally free of this burden. Well, in much the same way, Jesus died on the cross under the very wrath of God, you know, the same wrath that we fear. He did that to pay the penalty for us. And just to read a passage about this, where all this is laid out nicely and neatly for us by Paul, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, he says this, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel, which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Right? That's it. That's basically the gospel. You know, that is what we mean by the good news. Jesus did all of that because of our sins to forgive us of our sins. So don't let anything distract you from your need for forgiveness in particular. And that's probably the greatest danger at this point, uh, being distracted from really considering these things and acting on them. After a sermon like this, a good number of people miss the point and decide that they need to uh, do something else to try to please God. They think perhaps of just no longer sinning. Like, okay, well, if sin is such a big deal, I'll just stop doing it. Well, my first response to that is, good luck, you're going to need it. Uh, that usually doesn't work out all that well. Um, even among Christians that are truly following God and have truly been forgiven, that is a lifelong thing that we have to deal with in some way. But also, it's just not good enough to stop sinning. That is far from what needs to happen. Even if a person were to stop sinning entirely and provoke God to wrath no more, that person is still guilty of years of sin. You know, it's all still there. Like, 
even if from here on the record is clean, you've still got all of this. And you know what? That still has to be dealt with. There is still justice that needs to be done at that point. Some people go a different direction with all this, and they start trying to do as much good as they can possibly do. Like they start really ramping up the good deeds, so to speak. And to be fair, you're supposed to do good. And you're supposed to love God and love other people. All that is true. But again, the problem is still there. Even if a person were to do the utmost good, that person is still guilty of years of sin before that. That sin is still there, and there still has to be some kind of reckoning for that. Something has to be done about that sin. The fact is we need forgiveness. You know, that record needs to be cleared. Like you've got, it has to be purged out and you know, the black lines and the red marks have to be all whited out somehow. But sins can't simply be forgiven because they happened yesterday, nor because we're sorry for them, nor because we resolved to do better. Like none of those things are a solution. You know, we would never handle it that way in any other case and God doesn't handle it that way either. Sin requires punishment. And you have two options for that punishment. Either you can suffer for your own sins or someone else can take your place in that suffering. That's it. Those are the two options that are laid out for us in all of this. Either you suffer for your sins or someone else can take your place in that suffering. And that is why Jesus died, to take the place, to take our place under the wrath of God so that sins can actually be forgiven. That's why he's taking the punishment. You know, it's so that your record can be cleansed and you can be forgiven and not actually have to undergo the punishment yourself. So this is one of those sermons which uh, seemingly must finish on a kind of awkward silence. Perfectly fair. I mean, these are heavy things. But the reason for that is easy to know. I mean, these truths require us to think deeply and honestly about ourselves. You know, this is the kind of sermon that you hear, and your job is supposed to take it all and go away and actually think about these things and be honest with yourself about all of it. Now, as we normally do, we'll soon get ready for our mealtime. You know, that's still going to happen here. And there's always some hustle and bustle that goes along with that. We're all moving chairs and tables around and and getting food set out and all of that. And, you know, the younger people like to take a few moments to run around and play and talk and all those kinds of things, and adults are talking too. All that is fair. But if you sense that today's sermon is very much for you, uh, then maybe you need to t make the time to think for a while or pray or just decide that it's time to be done with sin and trust in what Christ has done to earn your forgiveness for that sin. You know, this is a time to act on these things. So, you know, despite all the energy that's about to go into getting ready for our meal time, if this has been for you, then let's make sure you do something about it. You know, let's make sure you give it the proper thought it needs. Let's make sure you're the one crying out to God. Let's make sure that you are actually, you know, trusting in Christ for this and repenting of sin and believing the gospel, as Jesus said. And of course, you know, Chad and I are always here to talk with anyone who thinks they maybe need to hear more or who need to ask questions or anything like that. You know, Chad and I are very much available. Even if we were talking to someone else, just feel free to interrupt and uh, do what you need to do in that regard. But for now, uh, let's end by praying, and then we'll have our meal time. Let's, let's have another time of prayer, though. Well, Father, uh, this is one of those times where we get to uh, double down on the, the, some of the greatest truths that you've shown us and the things most needful for us. Uh, I know that Chad and I are in some sense always talking about these things, but often as part of other things. And it is good, and I thank you that we're able to take some time to just talk about sin itself and what you've done in Christ to arrange for our forgiveness. And I thank you for that. I thank you for Christ. And I thank you that you've made a way and that you know, sin, as terrible as, as it is, uh, is not the last word and doesn't have to be by any means. So we thank you for your kindness to us and your grace. And I do ask that anyone here that 
uh, doesn't really know you through Christ and hasn't received this forgiveness of sin, I ask that your gospel would be powerful in their lives and would actually bring them to faith and trusting in you and, and coming to you for that forgiveness. And I ask that that happen despite the, uh, the energy of things that are about to happen as we get ready for our meal time. But I do ask you to bless the rest of our time uh, that we're together. And I ask you to remember us and have mercy on us in Christ's name. Amen. Let's get ready for our meal time.